Hey everybody, what is happening? Brent Axe here from Syracuse.com. We're live on the Syracuse Orange Basketball Facebook page here on the early morning hours of Friday. We've crossed from Thursday to Friday. Day one of the NCAA tournament is in the books, and it ends with Syracuse's season coming to an end. The Orange finished 20 and 14 on the 2018-19 season. First time that Syracuse loses in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Since 2006, falling to Baylor, a final score of 78-69 to in Salt Lake City tonight. So we are here live chatting with you after this game. Please like and share uh, this post if you are watching us live. If you're watching on YouTube uh, a little bit later on, we appreciate that. Uh, you can share that post as well. And uh, I would usually promote that we put up most of these chats up on YouTube, but this is going to be our last chat of the season so last time uh, we do have to tell you about that so lots to get into here not only with this game but it's come to an end so your immediate reaction to the 2018-19 season ending I asked this on Twitter I want to ask you guys here in the in the live chat as well you're going to say plenty of course in the chat but throw this comment in there uh, while you're describing of this game and, and getting those feelings out about this one. If you had to describe this past Syracuse basketball season in one word, what would that one word be? Because I think most people would come to disappointing. I think ultimately this will go down as a disappointing season for Syracuse basketball in a lot of ways. Certainly some highlights along the way, beating Duke and a couple other big wins for the Orange. But uh, I think ultimately, given the amount of talent that came back, one of the most experienced teams in the country, losing in the first round for the first time since 2006, right up to uh, yesterday, Frank Howard, the news that due to a violation of, of team policy, uh, couldn't play in this game. I don't know how much of a difference he would have made in this game for Syracuse. Maybe gives him a few more options at the three-pointer because I'll tell you what, this was a very entertaining game for about 30 minutes. And then Baylor started to really take control of this game in the second half. Syracuse just couldn't keep hitting shots at the clip that they were in the first half. Elijah Hughes, who played a terrific game overall, but didn't really keep pace there. Tyus Battle, while he had some big numbers, we'll go over the numbers here in a moment, missed a lot of shots down the stretch. Syracuse cooled off from the three-point line, and Baylor simply didn't. Baylor kept answering everything for Syracuse. It's one of the poor defensive efforts that the Orange have had, missing on shooters, not getting on shooters. So that ultimately led to Syracuse losing this game. But there were a few highlights here. So let's go over some numbers uh, for both sides. First of all, the three-point shooting was insane, and we thought we saw that uh, in the Virginia game. That was a one-sided affair. But Syracuse did answer Baylor for the most part. As we mentioned, it cooled off in the second half. But ultimately – Baylor finishes 16 of 34 from three-point range. That's 47%. But Syracuse goes 12 of 29. That's 41%. So what was usually a good mark for Syracuse, they were 8 and 1 coming into this game, making 10 or more three-pointers during the season. So that mark goes to 8 and 2 for Syracuse. Rebounding-wise, we heard so much about Baylor's offensive rebounding. They had 31 rebounds in this game. Nine of them were on the offensive boards. They cashed in a lot of those offensive rebounds, which was big. But Syracuse hung in there on the offensive and defensive rebounding end, 28 boards. Syracuse actually had more offensive rebounds in this game than Baylor did with 11. Uh, free throws matter. Syracuse missed three, and they all counted. Points add up down the stretch in games like this. 15 of 18, ultimately, uh, from the free throw line. Baylor only got to the free throw line nine times. They went six of nine. Makai Mason, who fought through a toe injury, banged knees during this game as well. He finishes with 22 points, including a four of 10 performance from three-point range. Kegler hits a few threes. McClure hits a few threes. For Baylor, a Kegler at 13 points. Butler hit a few threes as well, four of nine. From distance there, he had 14 points in this game. For Syracuse, Elijah Hughes with 25 points. That is a career high for him in this last game of the 2018-19 season. Uh, we mentioned the performance of Tyus Battle. The numbers are 16 points, but he shot 6 of 15, 3 of 7 from three-point range. And turned the ball over a few times in this game. O'Shea Brissett had some key turnovers in the second half as well. So I think where you needed Frank Howard was a little more offense and somebody to run the point because he had played really well 
in Charlotte at the ACC tournament, so Syracuse missed that. But uh, just to give you some more numbers, O'Shea Brissett finishes with 14 points on the night. We mentioned those six turnovers, which were key. He did lead Syracuse with eight uh, boards. Marek Dolzhai ends up with five points on the night, but it was Hughes, Brissett, and Battle that had a huge bulk of Syracuse's points. Buddy Bayheim had a very disappointing start in the NCAA tournament for his Syracuse career. He shoots 0 for 6, misses all four three-point attempts, only scored at the free-throw line, had a few assists, but ultimately starting for Frank Howard uh, didn't hold up his end of the bargain. Uh, should note that those 16 three-pointers that Baylor made in this game, that's a record for an opponent against Syracuse in the NCAA tournament. The previous high was 15, made by Southern Illinois in 1995, so a record that held for a long time goes down as Baylor hits 16 three-pointers in this game. So let's see what you guys are saying about this one. I uh, asked you to, you know, kind of sum up this season in one word. I'm sure you have more than one word, but uh, we'll see what you guys are saying about this one here. And uh, certainly the distraction of what happened with Frank Howard, you wonder how it affected this team because that's the last thing you want to deal with going into the NCAA tournament. Certainly not a new concept for Syracuse. Remember, Fat Mello was ruled ineligible right before the tournament in 2012. Arenzi Anawaku got hurt in 2010. In 2006, it was Deshaun Wright and Josh Wright ruled ineligible the day before the Vermont game that Syracuse ultimately lost in Worcester. TJ Sorrentine from the parking lot, so an unneeded distraction there. But it's not like Syracuse hasn't played without Tyus Battle throughout the season. They've done that. Or pardon me, without Frank Howard, Tyus Battle filling in at the point for Frank Howard. And, you know, either when Frank was hurt earlier in the season and then as the season went along, Frank just struggling and Tyus having to come in and, and kind of shoulder the load, which he did for a lot of this game. But when you dig into the numbers a little bit more, missed some shots, had some bad fouls, a couple bad offensive fouls for Tyus. He had a key foul on Mason down the stretch to put him in the free throw line. And kind of another second half fade for the Orange here as Baylor ultimately wins this one 78 to 69. So let's jump in here. You guys are going hot and heavy on the comments. So let's uh, see a little bit of what you are, are saying on the, uh, about this game here as uh, the reality sets in that season is over for Syracuse basketball. First, first round lost for them since 2006. Christian saying that Buddy. Uh, was not good on either end of the floor tonight. Yeah, he really missed uh, a lot of defensive plays as well. Uh, Joe saying the most disappointing team Syracuse has had in years. Rob noting that it hurt not having uh, Frank Howard out there. Brian saying one word, centerless. Yeah, Pascal Chuku certainly didn't take advantage of what was a smaller Baylor lineup. Uh, their best player in terms of size was Fred Gillespie, who had a, a few big plays down the stretch, including that home run pass that he put home for a dunk. At six foot eight, though, he's their tallest regular contributor. Uh, Pascal Chuku, just seven points, five rebounds on the night, which I think typically you'll take from him. But when you're facing a smaller team, you'd like to see him get more involved, certainly. Uh, Kevin noting that Frank told to hand over his jersey. Yeah, he wasn't even in the building tonight, which tells you, I don't know if they sent him home or not. I never got that really confirmed if Frank was in Salt Lake for this game. He was there Tuesday. He was there Wednesday. Uh, I don't know if and when they did send him home, if they did, but he was not in the building for this game. Owen says the one word is sad. This season has been unbelievably sad. Jack said, again, no adjustments at halftime. Jim even said it. They interviewed Jim Beheim at halftime on True TV, the only time of the year I watch True TV, by the way. Uh, they, have, they have some real good promos for that practical joke show that I'll have to watch in the offseason, I guess. But Jim even said it. At halftime, whoever gets on the shooters and plays better defense in the second half is going to win this game, and that ultimately was not Syracuse. Joe noting Bayheim's army or bust. Yeah, that's coming up this summer, the basketball tournament, and I know uh, you guys watch from all over the country, but the first time that that is going to be here in Syracuse uh, this summer, so we're certainly looking forward to that. Speaking of Bayheim's army players, former Orangeman Hakeem Warwick, responsible for one of the greatest moments in Syracuse basketball history, was actually at this game in Salt Lake City tonight. His G League team is playing in Salt Lake tomorrow and happened to be in town for the game, but uh, certainly didn't uh, bring the karma uh, from previous Syracuse success to this game. Uh, Anthony saying, what are the expectations for next year as people start to think about next year? You know, that's a great question because here you have a team that, 
came in this year with a lot of expectations with all the experience that they had, with the talent they had coming back. We thought that Tyus and O'Shea Brissett were both NBA talents. Uh, Tyus has fallen off the NBA boards. I think he'll still ultimately end up in an NBA camp somewhere. I don't know if he's going to get picked. O'Shea uh, would certainly, I think at this point, not go into the NBA draft and will be back for Syracuse next year. So you've got a backcourt that needs to fill Tyus Battle's departure. I, I am 100% certain he's gone. He's going to earn his degree. I think he wants to move on to a pro career. Frank Howard departs, and what a legacy for Frank Howard now. He goes down, you know, ultimately getting suspended for this game and uh, like we said, it's a shame in the sense that he was starting to turn that legacy around. He had a great tournament in Charlotte at the ACC tournament. And had he had a great tournament here, maybe people would have forgot some about the faults that he had. But ultimately, he goes out with a bitter pill in the mouth of Syracuse basketball fans. you got to replace those two in the backcourt. You know, Jalen Carey certainly going to get a little more run next year. You bring back Elijah Hughes. You bring back O'Shea Brissett. You bring back Buddy Beheim in the backcourt. How much will Joe Girard and – Bryson Goodine factor, the freshman in the backcourt next year. Um, you get Marek Doljai for another season, right? So you're, you're, le you're losing a lot of guys in the backcourt. Filling that backcourt is going to be really key for Syracuse and who steps in and kind of takes command of that backcourt. But we thought the Tyus Battle, Frank Howard backcourt, one of the most experienced in the country. You need great guard play in the tournament to win, right? That ultimately didn't come through. So thinking about next year, the expectations for next year uh, are going to be interesting because they were pretty high for this team coming in, and ultimately, certainly, they did not meet them. Uh, let's see. Daryl says, Brent, this team's 2-3 zone wasn't played well most of the year. Unlike past years, too many threes given up along with Buddy's no-show. No points and struggled on defense, especially first half against Mason tonight really hurt. Yeah, usually the zone is a huge advantage for Syracuse. It wasn't in this game for a couple of reasons. One, Baylor plays it. Baylor knows it and knew how to attack it and got hot. They had five three-pointers before the first TV timeout and just kept rolling from there. And Syracuse was helping Baylor by not getting on the shooters. How many open shots did Baylor have off just basic ball movement out there tonight? So yeah, the 2-3 zone, which has been such a weapon for Syracuse in the past, it even was last year when they made a Sweet 16 run coming out of the first four, uh, certainly wasn't uh, tonight in this game. Uh, Mark saying that Buddy really looked like a freshman tonight. He did regress, and it was the opposite. He was 11 of 27 from three-point range coming into this game, uh, but regressed out there tonight, and they needed him to fill in for Frank Howard, and, and certainly Buddy did not live up to expectation there. Jeff saying that next season will be much of the same. couple big ACC wins. They'll finish 6th, 7th, or 8th in the league, win a tournament game, and get an 8, 9, or 10 seed in the NCAA. Same old, same old. So Jeff sees the same path for next year's team as perhaps this year's team had, but ultimately shouldn't have had in the minds of many. Uh, Amber saying that battle at point guard never ends well and Buddy did not step up. Chris brings up a good point that Syracuse needs a rebounding forward. They really need that athletic guy inside. O'Shea Brissett's supposed to be that guy, but, you know, ultimately isn't. You, what you need is kind of an Isaiah Stewart type of player, which Syracuse, you know, recruited and ultimately didn't get. But, you, you know, they had Torian Thompson on the roster. He transfers away. You need that kind of athletic forward. You look back to, look, Syracuse made a nice run a year ago using their defense, but you go back to that Final Four run in 2016, they had shooters. You know, they had Malachi and Trevor Cooney, and Benajay could hit some shots, and they had some guys that could score. But ultimately, it was Tyler Roberson's great play in the tournament. He averaged near a double-double that kind of pushed Syracuse over the edge and gave them something that the past couple of teams have not had. They just don't have that athletic offensive presence in the paint. Chris, I think you make a good point, and that's something that Syracuse has to put a priority on. They've certainly looked for, but haven't struck in recruiting at this point. Uh, Brian saying, let's be honest, Cuse was a roller coaster all season and regressed a great deal. Uh, let's see, uh, McCullough, yeah, Chris notes uh, Chris McCullough falls in that category as well. He only played, what, 12 games or so before he got hurt and ultimately uh, went to the NBA as well. Uh, let's see, <laughs> Dan says, this is Marek's team now. Hey, Marek keeps getting better, hit a three in this game. We know he hustles. We know he can rebound, made some great passes in this game. But he's a guy that's going to improve kind of step by step as the season goes along. I'd love to see him take on a bigger role and, and work on his game and keep eating the pizza and the cheeseburgers and bulk up a little bit. But ultimately, he is still a role player. You need 
someone to take command of this team. And what this team really lacked at the end of the day, up until today, you know, I went on some radio shows and, you know, did some interviews and, and I pondered this myself on this chat, on, on my radio show, and that was what was the identity of this team? And right up until tip-off of this game, late tonight in Salt Lake, we didn't know. They kind of had a different identity night in and night out. Some nights it was Elijah Hughes' team. Some nights it was Tyus's team. In the ACC tournament, it was Frank's team. It's like everybody played hot potato until somebody caught it and held on to it. This team didn't have an identity. It really didn't. They kind of figured it out as they went along, whereas, again, last year, I hate to keep comparing them to last year, but you knew exactly what that team was. And they had to be that way because their backs were against the wall with only six players on that lineup. So this year's team never really formed that. Something to keep in mind for next year. Who are you? What are you? And, you know, the 2-3 zone is ultimately what identifies Syracuse, but they didn't play that with the same kind of tenacity and spirit and identity, to use that word, that Syracuse teams usually do. Uh, Matt saying we need more than one defensive set. Why not man-to-man, Brent? Why that's just what they do. I, you know, Bayheim's not going to come out of that zone. He rarely does. They pressed for a lot of the second half in this game. If you know, So if you consider that their use of man-to-man, they'll do it. You know, most times it, it could befuddle opponents. This is when it's really – you're supposed to cash in your chips right now in the tournament with the zone. But if there's a coach that knows it as well and uses it as often as Bayheim, it's, it's Scott Drew and Baylor. So, you know, usually you get a good draw – with the zone, and this time around, you got the bad draw. Uh, if you listen to Charles Barkley on the uh, TNT or what, whatever you know channel it is, they're, they're all over the place, True TV, uh, the CBS set, he says zones are easy to play against. I always enjoy uh, Charles Barkley's college basketball commentary, right? Yeah, because I love Charles on college hoops and Kenny Smith's generic comments on college basketball. This is March, right? Uh, let's see. Robert says kids these days light up when they see the other team play zone. They don't care anymore about dunking and driving. It's all about the three and how far back you can shoot from. Uh, the game has passed Bayheim by. Michael Antonio saying that Gerard will be a stud and will get consistent scoring. I'm a big fan of Joe Gerard. I think he's going to be a great player. I just hope that we, as the media, as the fans, as everybody collectively, Gives him time to adjust to the college game. Gives him time to adjust to the speed of college basketball. Uh, Joe is a terrific player, one of the best recruits Syracuse is coming in. He's one of the most accomplished athletes in the history of New York State, state champion in football and basketball, great outside shooter. But, you know, Joe didn't exactly have prime competition along the way in Glens Falls. You know, he didn't go to a prep school, didn't go to he, – he did play some AAU ball where he did considerably well, but – there's going to be an adjustment there for Joe, but that kid can flat out shoot the rock, and, and Bayheim's going to give him every opportunity to do that next year. I just hope we give him time to adjust because not every freshman comes in out of the box ready to go like Ja Morant did. You see Ja Morant from Murray State today? Oh, man, Murray State could be making a deep run. I hope you guys had them deep on your brackets. That was one of the easiest 12 seeds on the board to pick, right? Uh, Dan asks a, a fair question here. Anyone think that Jalen Carey is a transfer candidate? I, I'm going to say no, Dan. I understand why people would ask that question. He didn't get as much time as maybe he thought he would. You go back to when he played well at Madison Square Garden earlier in the year, and maybe he would kind of develop as he went. But speaking of freshmen that you have to give time to develop, get used to the college game, you know, he kind of fell in Bayheim's doghouse a little bit this year. From what I've heard, I don't have any inside information, but the assistant coaches are really encouraging him. He works his tail off at practice. He does like it here. It's a fair question to ask, but if I had to put money on it, Jalen Carey is going to be here and on this roster next year because he's got every opportunity to be the point guard at Syracuse next year. I don't know why you would throw that away when you can work through the summer, compete in the fall, and get a job at Syracuse next year, whereas if you transfer, you're sitting out a year. And usually transfers end up, you you kind of take a step down on the ladder. You look at Caleb Joseph who ended up, um, and, and, you know, what he actually got Creighton and actually got some playing time out there. And, you know, there were times where it looked like he was in a better situation and good for him. Thompson ended up at Seton Hall, got to play after sitting out a year. Although, you know, he, he's, I, I didn't see the final score from the Seton Hall game tonight. I saw that they were getting back in that one against Wofford, but you know, it depends on where you go and what your role is, but you got to sit out a year unless you're a grad transfer, which obviously Jalen Carey is not. So I don't think he's going to transfer. 
I wouldn't be surprised if he did. But if I had to take a guess, I think he's going to be on this roster next season. Uh, let's see. Gabriel saying poor coverage on the shooters. Uh, Robert noting that this is only the beginning. Uh, Eric saying bring Bernie back so an assistant can develop some low post players. That is one of the most tired and ridiculous um, narratives that's out there. That so, that somehow, some way, Bernie Fine was some kind of low post, you know, guru. As if Mike Hopkins couldn't coach those players. As if, you know, look, Syracuse needs that athletic forward in there. I think that's a fair point to make. But I think we're kind of overrating the kind of coach that Bernie Fine was. If you want to bring a coach in, don't bring him back. Bring in somebody that played the position. And for the record, people have always said, why doesn't Derek Coleman coach here? He has no interest in coaching here, doesn't want to do it. Is it a fair criticism that there's three guards on the coaching staff and maybe you mix it up positionally? We can have that discussion, but let's stop with this Bernie Fine with some sort of, you know, postman whisperer. I mean, the guy, you know, I'm just, I'm going to stop right there because I, I, I will really rant about that. But that is such a tired narrative. And uh, yeah, it's just wrong. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Rob makes a good point. I mean, Mike Hopkins developed, I know this name is blasphemous to say in some ways, but Fab Mello was a Big East all player. Rakeem Christmas was terrific under Hopkins. Like there were a few big men that, that really developed under Hop, Tyler Roberson, who I brought up earlier. So, you know, it's not like Hop couldn't coach at that position. Uh, let's see, Brian saying, uh, Baisley or Frank, who <laughs> screwed Syracuse more? Uh, definitely, uh, I think, Frank, because Basley was an addition. You you know, recruiting is, is funny that way. I wonder what – but here's why I say Frank, because at least Frank was here, he was a senior, and he let you down because you needed your senior at this point in the year. Basley, the way his decision-making went, you could tell his heart wasn't in it. He didn't want to be here. He had thoughts of being elsewhere. Even if you're only here for a season or two, you want somebody that's committed to it and is going to actually put their heart, their mind, and everything into playing college basketball. Clearly, he didn't. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's going to be interesting to see where he goes in the draft. Uh, the projections I saw lately had him going about, you know, somewhere in the second round. So that whole plan of let's just skip college altogether and be a first-round pick does not look like uh, it's going to work out for Darius Baisley. What could have been, though? It's certainly something to think about. Uh, let's see. Austin think a team will make 23-pointers versus Syracuse next year. It seems like a lot of teams were setting records this year, Virginia. And then tonight, 16 three-pointers, a opponent record in the NCAA tournament for uh, Baylor against Syracuse. Uh, let's see. Brian noting that Frank looked great in the ACC tournament. He did. You know, he had 28 points against Duke. He had 18 against Pitt. He had nine three-pointers in the ACC tournament, shot 50%. And ultimately, I think that's how people are going to look back on the season. Disappointing, frustrating, the what if, woulda, coulda, shoulda year that Syracuse basketball had. And not in the sense of think of a woulda, coulda, shoulda year like 2010. Well, that team absolutely would have went to the Final Four, in my opinion, had Arenze Anawako been there. 2012, yeah, you lost Fab Mello before the season started, but that team still made the Elite Eight and got, you know, absolutely just jobbed by the referees in that game against Ohio State. And then the last few years, they've made a couple surprise deep runs. Last year to the Sweet 16, 2016 to the Final Four. I don't think anybody had, you know, visions of those teams you know, winning a national championship or anything. But this team certainly had the talent to make a deep run. But you get to the tournament and have a night like this, and we've got all off season to ponder it, right? So on that note, I want to say this, and that is thank you. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to come here after every game, especially nights like tonight. I know it's not, you know, real late for some of you watching because we get viewers from all over the country. But for those of you that did stay up late with us, so many late games this year or just came by after a game. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed doing this. I enjoy the conversation with you guys. There's a lot of passion in Orange Nation out there, wherever you watch, and I really enjoy uh, doing this. And it's it just become part of my routine after games to do this chat and, and hang out with you guys. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here throughout the season. Um, we'll see what happens throughout the offseason with this team. It's going to be interesting, the adjustments that they make. I certainly anticipate Ty's battle will go, and you know we'll see what comes of the Frank Howard situation if we hear anything more about that. But ultimately, Syracuse loses to Baylor 78-69. to They end the season 
20 and 14. And my thanks to you for not only coming with us tonight, but hanging with us all season long here on Facebook Live. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll talk again soon. Please read my recap and all our great coverage on Syracuse.com. And we'll talk to you next time.